Hey. Friends, colleagues, honoured guests, welcome to the launch of the 23 Essex Street Chambers Academic Associates Panel. My name is Dr. Alex Green. I'm a lecturer in law at the University of York, as well as the academic chair of the panel. I will also be acting as chair for this evening's event, which is to be the first of many fascinating legal discussions brought to you by 23ES in the months and years ahead. Now, we were originally meant to be in the large pension room just across the way, but as those of you who've been following the UCU strike action will no doubt know, academics and large pensions no longer mix. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> Before introducing our speaker and discussant for this evening, I want to take an oppor the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the panel, of whom it's composed, and what we intend for it to achieve. First and foremost, the Academic Associates panel is designed to foster conversation and cooperation between academics and practicing members of chambers working within cognate legal areas. To this end, we've recruited an impressive list of luminaries, uh, myself excluded of course, <laughs> including our speaker for tonight's event. Other members of our panel include Professor Carolyn Hoyle, who's a Professor of Criminology at the University of Oxford, Dr. Colin King, Reader-in-Law at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London, Dr. Dave McArdle, Senior Lecturer and Head of School at the University of Stirling, Professor James Penner, the Kwak Guk Cho Professor of Property Law at the National University of Singapore, Dr. Finlay Stark, who's an Associate Professor in Law at the University of Cambridge, Professor Elise van Sliedrecht, Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Procedure at Tilburg University, and Professor Adrian Zuckerman, Emeritus Professor of Civil Procedure at the University of Oxford. That's quite an impressive list, I'm sure you'll agree. So comprised, this panel will allow members of chambers the opportunity to draw upon a wide range of knowledge across all sectors of 23ES's expertise. The contributions of panel members will not only be doctrinal, but also, where appropriate, criminological, sociological, and even philosophical, that's why I'm here, um, offering new argumentative resources whilst ensuring that Chambers remains at the bleeding edge of contemporary legal developments. You'll excuse the pun. Moreover, for our academic associates, the panel offers new <coughs> pathways to research impact, unique opportunities to draw on practical experience and expertise, as well as avenues through which our students can gain valuable additional access to practitioners, both within the context of formal events like this one and beyond. With all of this in view, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening's event. Dr. Jennifer Hendry, an inaugural member of our academic panel, is an associate professor in law and social justice at the University of Leeds, an Arts and Humanities Research Council Leadership Fellow, and an editor-in-chief of Cambridge University Press's German Law Journal. Her research encompasses social and legal theory, socio-legal studies, and comparative legal studies. Her most recent scholarship, which provides the subject of this evening's talk, develops theoretical and comparative perspectives on civil criminal procedural hybrids including the recently promulgated Knife Crime Prevention Order. That was the pun I didn't flag up properly earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> Acting as her discussant is, of course, Francis Fitzgibbon QC of 23ES, who sits at the head of our new panel as Chambers Chair, my counterpart, as it were. Francis has a wide-ranging and diverse trial practice covering all types of serious crime, as well as high-profile appellate work lately focusing on victims of human trafficking and miscarriages of justice in cases before the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Following Dr. Hendry's presentation, he will offer some comments of his own for around 20 minutes or so in discussion with Dr. Hendry, and then I will open to general discussion from the floor. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hendry, who will speak to us on the topic of the usual suspects, knife crime prevention orders, and the difficult regulatory subjects. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Francis, and thanks also to Brad Pomfret and Michal Murphy for their kind invitation to deliver this lecture. It's my very great pleasure to be the inaugural speaker for the academic panel and to mark its launch with you this evening. 
I'm going to talk about the Knife Crime Prevention Order. Um, the Knife Crime Prevention Order, uh, which I'll refer to as KCPO for ease of time, was introduced in January 2019, ostensibly in response to high and rising rates of knife crime in England and Wales. Intended as an additional preventive tool for use by police, the KCPO is one of the latest in an increasingly long line of hybridised civil criminal procedures aimed at preventing deviant or undesirable activity in circumstances where existing criminal justice provisions are seen as insufficient. The hybridity of such procedures lies in how, and despite their purportedly civil character, such orders carry criminal sanctions if violated. They proceed in stages. The court first identifies the objectionable behaviour, it then imposes restrictions aimed at its prevention, and accompanies these with a warning in the event of breach. My recently published article, upon which this lecture is based, critically analyses the introduction of KCPOs in England and Wales, considering the motivations behind their 11th hour addition to the Offensive Weapons Bill and the goals <coughs> underlying their <coughs> use. The article highlights KCPOs as a classic iteration of civil criminal hybrid procedures and argues that they represent an ideologically driven policy that is instrumentally and, in this instance, uh, disproportionately employed to regulate the behaviour of difficult populations, predominantly for KCPOs, black children in urban environments who carry knives. The article further argues that KCPOs explicitly target these usual suspect regulatory actors denying them the procedural protections of the criminal law with a view to controlling their behaviour and fast-tracking their criminalisation. It concludes by placing KCPOs within the broader trend of Westminster governmental reliance on explicitly preventive procedurally hybrid forms, arguing not only that they are illiberal, but also contrary to the rule of law. So this is broadly what I'll be arguing today, but first some context keeping track of my papers. <laughs> <laughs> there is a serious knife crime problem in England and Wales. In 2019, the Office for National Statistics published the worst knife crime statistics in a decade, noting a 7% rise in offences involving knives or sharp instruments recorded by police from 2018, and a 49% rise from 2011 when comparable records began. Such a context might suggest that KCPOs would be a well-received measure, but this really hasn't been the case. Indeed, civil actors such as the Standing Committee for Youth Justice expressed disappointment that the government's response in the form of KCPOs fell short of constituting a public health approach, especially considering the prominence of the public health discussion within parliamentary debates on the Offensive Weapons Bill. Instead of the public health approach, the priority for the government seems to have been the extension of police power. And as Victoria Atkins MP explained during one of those debates, and I quote, the government wanted to give the police the power through this bill to seek an order from the court on a civil standard of proof so that the state can wrap its arms around children if schools and local police officers think that they're at risk of carrying knives frequently so that the state can wrap its arms around these children if schools and local police officers think they're at risk of carrying knives frequently. For anyone sceptical as to what such arm wrapping on the part of the state might involve, Atkins clarifies that KCPOs mirror orders already in existence by placing negative and positive requirements upon children who do not necessarily have a criminal conviction. Again, I quote, so the Offensive Weapons Act 2019, Section 14 of Part 2, provides that the courts can make such orders in respect of a person aged 12 years of age or over without a conviction if that court is satisfied on the balance of probabilities that this person has had a bladed article with them without good reason or lawful authority in a public place, school or college on at least two occasions within the preceding two years. An additional condition is that the court thinks 
that such an order is necessary to protect the public from the risk of harm involving a bladed article or to prevent a defendant from committing a crime with said bladed article. Punitive criminal sanctions, such as a custodial sentence of up to two years, a fine or both, can be imposed on breach. In this regard, KCPOs are a clear point of continuity in an established policy trend of using preventive hybrid procedures to control undesirable potential behaviour. You can probably guess that I don't like these very much. <laughs> KCPOs are concerning for several reasons. First, they are largely intended to marshal the behaviour of children. Although the stated aim is prevention, the likely age of individuals subject to KCPOs and the comparative ease of inadvertent breach of the positive or negative requirements can really only contribute to the stealth criminalisation of disadvantaged children. A second issue is that the personalised positive <coughs> and negative requirements the orders impose upon the individual combined to comprise severe restrictions upon the individual's movements and activity, both online and off. The pre-conviction restrictions, these pre-conviction restrictions, sit, to my mind, very uncomfortably against the civil standard of proof being employed by the court, severing the classic criminal law connection between criminal activity and responsibility. And finally, there are issues of race, not only are KCPOs likely to contribute further to the over-policing of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities through, for example, the use of alleged compliance ensuring techniques such as heightened stop and search or surveillance, they're also liable to result in more black children subject already to a KCPO being disproportionately found to be in breach. The issues outlined here that they explicitly target children, unduly affect black children, and are disproportionate, stigmatising and restrictive, can be situated more broadly within what's been come to known as <coughs> criminal law's preventive term. And in this sense, two further points are worth noting. The first of these is that the preventive nature of KCPOs mean that they operate proactively. And this is in advance of the activity or of the behaviour that would normally attract the label criminal. This preemptive logic of security is what paves, paves the way for earlier and earlier intervention on the part of the state in the name of the greater good. And I mention in the name of the greater good because this is in so far as it means the benefit of the virtuous majority. In their orientation towards first the anticipation and then preemptively the combating of risky behaviour, KCPOs, like the ASBO before them, can be said to represent a form of criminalisation. And I'm aware that this might be a controversial point for this audience. The second point um, that I'll make here is that uh, the justification of the use of KCPOs comes in the form of normatively mot motivated political expediency, often in reflex response to tabloid media fueled and emotionally charged public concerns about crime. And the difficulty with this is uh, in real or even in perceived situations of crisis or uncertainty, the precautionary approach prompts decision makers to err on the side of caution, and I think we can recognise that caution invites prejudice. Accompanying this reassurance rhetoric on tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, restoring public confidence, I think there comes a counterfactual focus on the alien other as in this example, the preventive reduction of youth knife crime. But prejudice is even more insidious in this particular context because layered upon this criminology of the other is the myth of black criminality. So without needing to be told, without needing proof, the public already believes that in the context of knife crime, the offenders are young black men. They are 
unemployed, benefit dependent, involved in drugs, other antisocial behaviour and general low level criminality. And so the refrain goes, those deviants are found in this part of town. They dress in those clothes, they listen to that music, they hang around in an intimidating manner. And well, if normal criminal justice processes aren't effective, then more powers are simply necessary so that something can be done about them. And while the reactionary aspects of this inherent procedural instrumentality are troubling in themselves, this is even more so in light of the fact that such expediency on questionable grounds of security is de facto privileged over considerations of civil liberties, human rights, and importantly for my purposes, due process. The important point to note here, and what I would like to emphasize, is that KCPOs allow for the regulation not just of undesirable behavior, but of those individuals suspected of such behavior. Okay, so far I've argued that KCPOs are not only targeted towards preventing particular antisocial or undesirable behaviours, but also employed instrumentally to control difficult regulatory subjects. My argument here is that instead of being treated as either the, responsi the responsible, public punishable subject of classical criminal law or the virtuous or rational subjects of responsive regulation, individuals made subject to KCPOs are preemptively designated as deviant or difficult to control. Categorization as a difficult regulatory subject is enabled by status criminalization, which is not premised upon actual behavior, but rather bad character itself underwritten by a combination of populist punitivism and racialized othering. What do I mean here by the punishable subject? I'm conscious of how much philosophizing I should be doing. I'll leave that to Alex. What do I mean here by the punishable subject? Well, criminal law is an instrument used to govern subjects, and it does this by means of responsabilization. By holding an individual responsible for their actions, criminal law demonstrates an innate respect for that individual as a rational agent, that is, as a responsible and reasonable person. And this yoking of individual rationality to individual responsibility performs an important legitimating function for the criminal law, which derives its own considerable authority from this premise that limitations have been adequately communicated by the state to its citizens and that each of those citizens recognises the boundaries of reasonable behaviour. Responsibility can be understood in this way as a mechanism of standard setting for the purposes of maintaining social order. But individual responsibility plays a very, very different role in regulatory regimes than it does within the criminal law. The responsive regulation regime, for example, responds to non-compliance with the escalation of sanctions, a disincentive structure. So a uh, responsive dynamic model um, is intended to solve the problem of when to punish and when to persuade. And the idea is that as progress is made up the regulatory pyramid, so the interventions increase in their punitiveness. The subject of responsive regulation is trifurcated, correspondent to three stages of responsive regulation. So we have the virtuous actor, for whom techniques of restorative justice will be employed, the rational actor, whose behaviour will be met with techniques of deterrence, and the incompetent or irrational actor, for whom the remaining strategy is inca incapacitation or removal. So those are the three. I focus really on the virtuous and the rational actor. So in terms of controlling a subject's behaviour, the respective regimes of criminal justice and responsive regulation operate according to fundamentally different values. While criminal justice is founded 
on principles and that impartiality, what we see in regulation is a flexible kind of pragmatism. Notable here is the ability of responsive regulation to pivot from the maintenance of an established, publicly promulgated general standard into differential, often individualised, treatment of our regulatory subject. So we have a shift from a general to a particular. And this personalised control um, facilitates targeted interventions by the state into the life of the regulated subject, with their behaviour often being subject to bespoke restrictions. The KCPO, in terms of its negative and positive requirements, I argue is a paradigmatic example of this. So while the contrast here with this abstract, universal, moral, punishable subject of the criminal law couldn't be starker, this is not to say that the distinction is in and of itself necessarily problematic. So where the distinction between compliance and punitive approaches within crime control to be maintained robustly, then there really wouldn't be much of a problem. Real crime would still receive punishment, while those committing victimless regulatory offences would be held to account through compliance mechanisms. The difficulty here, the difficulty with KCPOs, is that the dynamism of responsive regulation in terms of this uh, disincentive structure precludes the separation, with each approach being seen instead to comprise just another part of the crime control toolkit. And I think it helps now to return to the case study of the KCPO, because unlike the punishable subject as discussed, an individual made subject to a KCPO is not afforded the respect of the criminal law in its recognition of their wrongdoing and thus their responsibility because such recognition necessarily fails without evidence of there being <coughs> any wrongdoing. Similarly, as a regulatory subject, an individual exposed to differential or ad hominem treatment under the law is not afforded the respect of equal consideration as a citizen. And a core element of the rule of law is that it does not permit fundamental differentiations in status among members of the relevant polity. Indeed, the rule of law can be understood as equality before the law in the sense that government must govern under a set of principles that are, in principle, applicable to all. And I quote Dwork in there. So society is not only reliant on citizens respecting the authority of government to set rules as demonstrated by behaviour compliant with those rules, but this needs also to be a relationship of reciprocal respect. Governments are reciprocally required to respect their citizens as self-determining rational agents capable of comprehending and conforming to rules. And this right to respectful consideration is compromised in the event that the basic equal status of citizens is differentiated without sufficient and provable justification, whether that differentiation concerns an individual or a group or a subgroup. It's my argument, my argument here and my argument also in the paper, where the KCPO, via the form of its two-step civil criminal hybrid procedure, violates this basic egalitarian precept by eliding the classic distinction between compliance and punishment. The problematic result of this elision is that the regulatory subject is here escalated to becoming the punishable subject without having committed a crime for which another citizen would be held similarly liable. And here, having been all very flexible and pragmatic and positive, this much vaunted flexibility of responsive regulation becomes much more of a concern than a benefit because the dynamic relationship between prevention and sanction fast tracks the difficult regulatory subject into the self-fulfilling category. So I think at this stage it might be worth reiterating my three core points. The first is that 
KCPOs facilitate the preemptive regulation, the anticipatory regulation of the behaviour of individuals whose wrongdoing remains merely potential. Secondly, while prima facie gears towards the prevention of undesirable behaviour, which is the carrying of a knife or a bladed article, KCPOs instrumentally and disproportionately target specific categories of individual, the usual suspects, as I call them, of knife crime. Third, while it's acknowledged that future governance requires the making of risk calculations, the inclusion of subjective perception uh, within such calculations opens the door to dangerous othering within the operation of KCPOs. And to these points, I'd like to add a further two. That this othering is both obscured and justified by reliance on perceived bad character instead of actual conduct, and that this reliance is itself unjustifiable. So just to be absolutely clear on this point, what I'm talking about here is that in England and Wales, in 2019, under what was a stated public health banner, under scrutinised legislation, much like the stuff we're having right now, was passed that not only perpetuated the problematic idea that either being a particular sort of person or having a particular status in itself can ground criminal responsibility, but which also targeted this instrumentally at this country's disadvantaged children. And I think that this is made even more sinister when viewed through the prism of race. Um, and I quote here Patrick Williams and Becky Clark's 2018 paper, where they say there has long existed a special social category attributed to young black men which serves to legitimise the development and application of increasingly complex and punishing penal apparatus. Such status criminalisation trades on abstractions and stereotypes and contributes to insidious generalisations concerning cultures and subcultures. This vicious cycle is driven by the fiction of official crime figures where processes of status criminalisation combined with general community over-policing serve to perpetuate folk devil type ideas, for example, of black violence and black criminality. So while this broad brush othering of status criminalisation appears on the face of it to sit at odds with the heavily personalised ad hominem control experienced by an individual made subject to KCPO, these can arguably be understood merely as escalating steps within the same preventive control mechanism. So risky or undesirable behaviour is presumed to be undertaken by risky or undesirable people. And so these difficult regulatory subjects need to be controlled before they commit a crime. And the two-step progression of the KCPO and other two-step uh, hybrids is premised upon this presumed inevitability of criminal behaviour which needs to be controlled preemptively by means of these individualised restrictions and requirements. <coughs> by designating individuals and indeed whole groups of people as potentially deviant on the grounds of risk mitigation and crime prevention, these individuals are reduced to being a mere means to a securitised end. And this is, I argue, wrong on two particular counts. The first is where the ends in question are improved public security and reduced crime rates. The regulatory differentiation on the basis of group membership treats members of that group as lesser in status uh, than members of the virtuous or the non-difficult majority. And secondly, although the preemptive techniques of control, certain individuals and groups are deliberately exploited as a means towards the stated end of public security, with the result that these otherwise rational beings are placed out with. They're placed out with the rest of society, um, who are allegedly being protected by such securitised measures, 
and out with the number of individuals aggregated to form the public, this virtuous majority, whose safety, whose right to security are apparently paramount. Our concern here should really be in the deliberateness of this social division and the manner in which the rights and procedural protections of one part of society are jettisoned to privilege the security of another. So my final argument this evening concerns that specific division, and that is that the use of civil criminal procedural hybrids, as I call them, constitutes a problematic new regulatory, like regulatory technique, say that fast, for controlling the behavior of socially demonized usual suspects. And the use of hybrid procedures, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with them, um, I argue is driven by two recognised prosecutorial inconveniences within traditional criminal law. First, the procedural and evidential requirements of the criminal law being stricter than for civil processes, certain procedural safeguards being in place for the protection of a subject or a suspect or an accused. And second, that where the behaviour is merely undesirable but not criminal, the criminal law doesn't even if that behaviour occurs repeatedly or on an ongoing basis. For example, recurring knife possession. Hybrid procedures are used instrumentally to provide a means by which not only can elevated safeguards be circumvented, but undesirable conduct, whatever that may comprise, can be regulated. And I think this can be clearly seen by the type of of activity regulated by such hybrid procedures. So I focused on the KCPO, but we can go back to the first football banning order in 1987. 1998's famous, controversial, and now defunct in England and Wales anyway, ASBO, the Public Space Protection Order in 2014. Earlier this year, the Domestic Abuse Protection Order, April 2021. And I should also flag here the newly proposed Anti-Protest Serious Disruption Prevention Order contained in the Police Crime and Sentencing, Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill being discussed this very week in the House of Lords. Such measures are ostensibly intended to curtail or otherwise restrict behaviour deemed contrary to public safety and security. But they do so by privileging ideologically driven experiencing over considerations of due process. And they facilitate treatment that is differential and serves to escalate the individual from, as I said, the regulatory subject to the punishment punishable subject. In these legislative moves, what we see is a proactive forestalling of potential harms. Um, and the preemptive logic of security that I mentioned earlier is once more clearly evident. Um, Andrew Ashworth and Lucia Zedner have written on this point and noted that the, the fact is that the British government has seized on the civil preventive order as a model for increasing social control without the need to abide by protections accorded to the defendants in criminal cases. To these observations, I think, can be added a third. Under the guise of flexibility, of pragmatism, the government is relying on hybridised procedures to manage and control undesirable populations. And I contend that this observable pattern introduces hybrid proceduralism as a distinct technique, one deployed disproportionately and speculatively against so-called risk communities. Risk communities are preemptively identified as potentially deviant for the purpose of mitigating risk for the rest of society. And this is classic risk management. The potential danger is identified and steps are taken to contain it before that risk either increases or manifests. And what is noticeable here is the slippage between risk assessment premised upon conduct, individual conduct, and that premised upon group or population membership. It's worth reiterating here that what this facilitates is the establishment of allegedly dangerous subjectivity premised not upon individual agency, 
but rather on association or categorization. And while this inherently discriminatory dimension of preventive measures is concerning in itself, it is in its combination with the procedurally hybrid form that it becomes troubling. For these are not measures that maintain the initial distinction between real crime and regulatory offences, where the latter constitutes a method of regulation free of moral implications. On the contrary, civil criminal procedural hybrids can be disproportionate, restrictive, stigmatising and criminalising. The operative elision here of civil and criminal procedure for the achievement of, if not explicitly criminal law objectives, then certainly security ones is worth noting here. But this is not merely criminalisation creep. More than merely creeping criminalisation, hybrid proceduralism can be identified by, among other things, its, exper its experimental quality, its imaginative use of the different levers of control and compliance, the manner in which it fast tracks criminality via an escalatory process, the insidious way it targets populations perceived as other or in some other way undeserving of the protections of the rule of law. Because that's ultimately what we're talking about when we, um, when we talk about the due process protections being bypassed, it is that these populations are in some way undeserving of the protections of the rule of law. And so it's with a sense of disquiet about the preventive hybrid form that my critique and my lecture will conclude. By presenting KCPOs as a paradigmatic example of civil criminal procedural hybridity and the latest in a continuous and problematic policy trend, I've argued that hybridity lies at the heart of its most problematic features. As a regulatory, like regulatory technique, Hybrid proceduralism arguably moves beyond mere criminalization creep by virtue of encompassing both the status of the individual and the potential behavior in a quite deliberate manner. And this legislative intentionality, I think, begs our attention. Within a responsive regulatory cycle, such procedurally hybrid forms, in effect, create the difficult regulatory subject and reduce their procedural safeguards. An optimistic reading of this situation where the allegedly, allegedly softer regulatory regime has ended up being harsher for certain differentiated populations than the existing criminal law could be that the balance between securitization and due process has been inadvertently disturbed by a well-intentioned yet overblown interventionalism. A more sceptical reading, however, and this is one that I will leave you to ponder, is that regular and repeated use of this regular technique as clear evidence of a continuous and dysfunctional pattern. And in this regard, these practices of othering, which I've argued are inherent to such preventive hybrids, are exposed less as unanticipated and in unintentional consequences of hybrid proceduralism and more likely to be its ideological goals. And I will stop there. By all means. Well, yes. Jen, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a most stimulating uh, lecture discussion. Um, for, for me, as uh, a, 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 a almost time-expired criminal hack, the opportunity to think about the philosophical underpinnings of aspects of criminal law is an immense privilege and something that one doesn't really often have time to do in the cut and thrust of, of practice. So it's, it's a real treat to, to be exposed to this level of, of philosophical analysis behind a potentially very tricky crossover, as, as Jane has pointed out, between the, the regulatory model and the classical criminal model of how to deal with social problems. Um, I, I, I would, I'd like to continue the discussion. We could go on for a very long time, but time is pressing. I, I'd like to start the discussion by 
inviting Jen and all of you to um, take part in a small thought experiment. I should say that I am no criminologist and I'm not a legal scholar, so just bear with me. Um, now, imagine a world in which we had no restrictions on people carrying weapons, knives, bladed articles. Uh, I think it would be a very ugly world and it would, in, it would be a world with a, a much greater incidence of violence than we already have. And you only have to look at the United States and the ineffective or non-existent gun control there to see that, that if you've got a weapon, you're going to use it. So I think the first premise is that having control over people carrying weapons is probably a, a good thing, uh, and society is better uh, with that sort of control. And I don't think anyone seriously going to disagree with that, except perhaps some really hardcore libertarians, of course, there are some of whom may be among us. Um, <laughs> but if that's right, if, we, if, if that level of control is axiomatic for, for, for a good society, then the question is, what do you do with people who don't subscribe to it, people who are going to carry knives anyway? Now, you can certainly arrest those who are committing offences and deal with them in the traditional way, treating them with the respect that they are due as presumptively rational people who can then be punished according to law if they're guilty. But what about the rest? What about the people who haven't yet quite cross the threshold of actually committing crimes but who are going around carrying knives. What do we do about them? Do we just let them wander around until they pull a knife on somebody or until a policeman happens to see them with a knife and stops them? Uh, a, 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 a class of people who also, I think one has to say, are subject to the sort of othering and stereotyping and profiling that uh, Jennifer correctly deplores. Um, but when you actually look at the, I'm, I'm looking at it here, at the, the text of the Offensive Weapons Act, 2014, that, so 2019, that deals with these injunctions, they're clearly aimed at children and young people because the, the injunction comes into force, it is available, where someone has been carrying an, a, a bladed article on at least two occasions in a public place, so anywhere, but specifically on school premises or on further education premises. So you can see there that the, 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 the cohort that they're looking at is, is children of school and college age. And that there may be justification in thinking that that is a group of people who not only are apt to carry knives, but are apt to have absolutely no idea how dangerous a knife can be when you plunge it in somebody else's body. So my question for Jen... Sorry, it's quite a long run-up to the question. <laughs> um, my, my, my question for, for Jen really is, if that group of people exists, what do we do about them? Actually, there's a second question as well, which is, if they're children or people who, whose, let's say, whose, whose brains and cognitive abilities have not fully developed, is it right to treat them as the rational actors, as people who are presumptively responsible in the way which undoubtedly we should treat all adult citizens, or are they a, a separate group for whom more bespoke measures are required to prevent the harm that they might commit. So that's my long question. It's a hard question. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of moving parts there. So um, we'll start with, the, start with the children point first. Um, I think, as you say, the aims of, um, of the legis legislation, particularly in, a, uh, in the KCPO without conviction, um, are quite clear. It's to target a very um, discreet group. Um, I think it's a very draconian measure considering that the positive and negative requirements that these children could be um, subject to for up to two years um, can be associational, um, so don't hang out with that guy, or geographic, don't go to that part of town, and they can include going to certain websites, 
Um, and they can be things like make sure you go to school, make sure you go to counselling, make sure you go to anger management, um, and make sure you're home by nine. And for a teenager, they're all pretty easy to breach. So I feel that in terms of the way that the KCPO has been established, they're almost designed so that kids breach them. And this is, this strikes me as strange and unusual legislation to design if what you are intending to do is privilege the safety of a particular population, so other people in school with those kids. And I think there's a couple of moving parts there. The first one would be, is this the role, is this really a, a role for the criminal justice system? And I think that's probably the primary consideration there. Like, is this something that must be regulated by the criminal law? It couldn't be regulated through another mechanism or another set of circumstances. Um, and another one is exactly why do these children feel the need to carry a bladed article? And I think initially a lot of the discussions, I, I, read, I read a lot of this on Hansard, goodness, these debates went for quite some time. Um, and a lot of the discussion involved um, this public health approach. Um, it's, a, it's an approach that's actually um, been promulgated in Scotland according to the, the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow in particular, which for a long time was stabbing capital of the world. Mm. Stabbing is different from slashing, apparently. Limerick was slashing capital <laughs> of the world, while Glasgow had the stabbing crown for a while and now it's, it's lost it through to this public health-based intervention. But it's been enormously successful and it's because what it has done is taken World Health, health Organization recommendations to treat um, public <coughs> violence as a, as a health concern, as a, as a disease, treat, treat violence as a disease, as something viral, heaven forfend, that can be, that can be addressed, that can be, that can be mitigated. And this has been actually done to, to very good effect in, uh, in, uh, in, in Glasgow under, albeit quite um, specific circumstances. Um, and the public health approach has specifically targeted social deprivation and poverty as being some of the indicators in the first instance, but also markers and causes of um, violence and specifically um, the domestic, um, not specifically domestic violence and abuse, but, but domestic forms of violence that can lead to the social context of people carrying now. So I think those are arguably two potential responses that have rather danced around the central <laughs> part of your question, which you're probably going to reiterate now. But but that's probably where I should start. All right. Francis, can I abuse my position as chair of course to you chip can. in on this point? Because I think there's, there's, there's two very important things I would like to add to everything that Jen said, which I agree with, um, of course. Um, the first is you when you represented the overlap between disadvantaged and stigmatized groups and those who are carrying knives, you use the word also, which I think belies the central concern to a, to a certain extent, because these groups are constructed, as Jen put it, in a criminalized manner, and that the, the overlap might not be one of correlation, it might also partially be one of cause. And I think there is a difference, isn't there, between the public health approach taken in Scotland and the KCPO as being proposed here. And attached to this, the second point, which is related to this, is it's not like by being subject to the KCPO, these children are being sort of taken out of the stream of the responsible subject under criminal law, because breach of a KCPO is a criminal offence. So you know, they are still being treated as, as it were, instrumentally rational. And I think the concern is also partially that they're being constructed as criminals by having these sort of potential criminals, I suppose, is the point, right? Um, which is where the, the point about othering comes in. It's, it's not a correlative, it's a causative, at least on one interpretation of the, the data, right, right? Abusive chair position over, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think there's another aspect to this as well, which is 
leaving aside for the moment, because I'm sure we'll come back to it, the, the philosophy of this, whether it actually makes any difference at all. Um, the, 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 these different kinds of orders are like not weed around the, the law, and when they, when they abolished ASBOs, they replaced them with ASBs, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the Antisocial Behaviour Injunction. Um, uh, the um, Council of C Civil Justice uh, did a report on the effectiveness of ASBs in 2020, I think 2020, in which it concluded that there were serious structural problems with the way that these things were, were enforced. Not the least of which was um, th these are these I, th I think I'm correct if I'm wrong uh, exist in the county court, which does not have access to the probation service, for example. So so y you can give someone the injunction, and the follow up isn't really there in the same way as it would be in the in the criminal court. Um, there's a postcode lottery, so that if you're told as a positive requirement to get drug treatment or do some activity that's been specified. If you live in the wrong place, it's not there for you. So, so the the actual follow through of some of this stuff doesn't really exist. So you have to question whether it actually these things actually achieve the things that they set out to achieve, or whether they are. Um, I don't want this to become too political, but since Jen's opened this particular can, we'll let some more worms out. Whether these are simply um, seen as quick fixes that give, give the government of the day, whichever it may be, uh, a, a little boost because it appears to be doing something about crime. Um, and in fact, the, the long-term effects are, are, are minimal. I mean, people, there are still loads of stabbings in London. We have all these orders. And so you can measure their success, really, against the, the, the amount of crime that, that persists. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot to be said for this as a new regulatory technique. There seem to be more and more and more of them. It was what caught my interest in the first place. That the um, there was a there was a recent consultation in Leeds, where where I'm based, um, on a public space protection order and the extension of what was included in the public space protection order. And one of them was um, people putting their wheelie bins in the street the drama around wheelie bins <laughs> in this public discussion. But the other one was um, uh, un, uh, unsanctioned, undocumented dwellings, which is effectively to prevent tents that homeless people are sleeping in so that they can be moved on within particular public space. Now, of course, this order doesn't, um, doesn't target an individual the same way that a KCPO would or, or an ASBO as was, um, but it covers a particular space and a particular behaviour within that space, and it's pretty obvious who it is that's going to be putting up a tent in uh, particular spaces within Leeds city centre, and it's people who don't have anywhere else to go. So I think once again you can see that there's a um, there's an instrumentality to this type of order, even if it is just to give the power and the weight of the criminal justice system in terms of a stated pro prohibition. Um, so there is, I think I'm both agreeing and disagreeing with you there, that I think there is a performative aspect to these orders in terms of, you know, as we see this Christmas tree bill passing through the Lords right now, there's, there's new orders going up here, there and everywhere. But... Um, you know, the, the serious violent reduction order would be one, although it's obviously post-conviction. There's the uh, serious disruption um, uh, prevention order, which is effectively the insulate Britain uh, ASBO, um, we could call it. And um, I, I, and they, they just abound all of a sudden the DAPO from, from earlier this year. Um, so arguably, yes, maybe this isn't a new regulatory, like regulatory technique. I must get better at saying that. <laughs> a new regulatory technique so much as a different way of the government perhaps signifying an intention that it, uh, that it would like to be more active within a particular area and yet knowing that it would be very hard to have any real bite. Okay, I've, I'm going to ask you one more question, Is that a hard one? and then perhaps we can go over to the audience. 
Um, yes, I think it is a hard okay. one. Yes, I, I intend it to be a hard one. <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is the, the proposition that under, under, I say under, almost undermines, underpins so much of our law that the people who come before the courts are rational actors mm. and are to be treated with, with respect. Now, what if that's wrong? Mm. What, 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 if that, what if that actually is a, is a myth, a, a useful myth, but actually a myth, and that a load of the people who come before the courts or who get into trouble cannot be described in that way mm. and should not be expected to behave as if they were rational actors responsible mm. for what they do. There. That is, that is a hard <laughs> one. Um, well, I mean, I think there's, again, it depends the extent to which we texturise rational actors, because if we're talking about simply being uninformed, then being uninformed doesn't affect your rationality. If we're talking about someone's mental capacity, then um, our very liberally understood mental capacity regulation, mental capacity legislation, um, would allow for effectively for substituted decision making now um, under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. There's a um, Article 12 suggests that we shouldn't be depriving anyone of their of their legal capacity because of a mental capacity limitation, that there should be universal legal capacity. So I think that that would probably be the wrong way, to my mind certainly, to approach it, whether we're looking at a situation of supported decision making. I suspect in that immediacy of wrongful conduct. It's difficult because I think in terms of knife possession, everything is anticipatorily of the, anticipatory of the conduct. Um, and so it's difficult to pinpoint exactly the conduct that would be targeting. But I suspect that in terms of rational actors, simply being uninformed isn't good enough. And I think we'd probably have to be questioning someone's, questioning someone's mental capacity in the sense of diminished responsibility to avoid holding them responsible for the behaviour. Okay. Just to add, um, insofar as I'm an international lawyer, which I am on some days of the week, some states have a long and unstoried history of dealing with populations on the basis that they're irrational and it never ends well. Um, I think it may very well be the case. I am sometimes very irrational, but I want the state to always treat me as if I am otherwise. Um, because the alternative just seems so far beyond the pale, not just practically, I think, but also morally and expressively. I think that's very important. But, yes, um, I abused my position as chair once more right at the end there. Probably allowed to do it again. Yeah, I know, I'll be chucked out. Um, shall we open to questions from the floor? Uh, right, yes, uh, please, and I've got... Two over there. So, so thank you. Good what an interesting yes. um, talk, and thank you for the idea about these orders being really about othering. Um, it's put me in mind of um, an idea to expose the othering, perhaps, or to jump on the bandwagon if um, if this bandwagon is going to keep going and going, and there's always going to be these these preventative orders. What about? Corporate misconduct prevention orders. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you're 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 not othering. These are parts of the establishment. Mm. These people run companies and businesses. But you know, you could identify the kind of businesses that are most likely to cause harm, and you could put orders on sectors of the economy. And I think I can just about work out what particular organisation you <laughs> might just. <laughs> <think about. laughs> On a balance of probabilities, right? Can I, um, can I say that, that Fl Flora Page, who asked the question, hmm. has been intimately involved in the, um, the, the appeals by the post office, postmasters and postmistresses. So, so I think this is something very dear to her heart. <laughs> it would have been very nice to have you know, preempted that particular hmm. bit of misconduct. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there'd be all sorts of ways hmm. that we could preempt corporate misconduct. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, I think my concern with the two-step type of order is the it's the fast tracking of the criminalisation dimension. It's that it's that 
pivot where it just flips into all of a sudden this is a criminal penalty. So you didn't abide by curfew, so you you have six months in a in juvie basically. And that seems that seems a stretch. So in terms of corporate misconduct, then perhaps six months in juvie wouldn't do them any harm. But it's um, I, I find them generally a little unsettling as uh, uh, as 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 a fast tracking mechanism. Mm. Uh, yes. So I just ask, you, you talk about the public health approach yes. in Scotland. I know nothing about that. Um, could you at least inform me, if nobody else, what that means? Yes. So the um, the World Health Organization has recognised um, poverty and violence as being um, things that effectively um, cause vicious cycles in terms of um, further violence and social deprivation. So the public health approach that was taken by specifically the Violence Reduction Unit in Glasgow was effectively to target at its source um, violence taking place in um, socially deprived communities where um, it was recognised that those, and I think this speaks to Francis' point, those were the communities from which young people were likely to come out and be violent within public spaces and to carry um, uh, what in Glasgow would be called a chib. So effectively, a, 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 let's, let's just keep it, keep it polite and call it a bladed article, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's effectively a, a homemade um, a homemade little death device. <laughs> so the um, the thinking is effectively that by targeting the circumstances leading to um, violent behaviour, which are identified specifically as poverty and violence at home, um, specifically domestic violence, but also um, uh, the kind of classic trope of the kind of bored teenager and the young gangs. And and things like that, that it can be um, that these connections can be broken, and generationally you'll see a, a positive development. And actually, knife crime, specifically in Glasgow, has dropped quite considerably. I don't have the st statistics to hand, I'm afraid, but they've dropped quite considerably, and it's been held up as a as a success story in, in specifically the south side of Glasgow um, and and some other local authorities in Scotland. So that's a public health approach, but it's. It's something that featured a huge amount in the Hansard debates, and I think a lot of the, the, the youth justice associations and other civil society actors were really positive about this being, um, this featuring in the, in the discussions and, and in the legislation, and it just didn't ultimately, and it was all very prescriptive and um, curfews and curfews and depressing limitations. So is, is, isn't there a gap between that sort of approach, which mm. is taking a sort of a section of the community as a whole, a particular area, a particular place code, mm. and injecting some cash into that area. And uh, on the one hand, uh, and at the other end of the scale, uh, literally arresting and prosecuting people for carrying knives mm. on, on the other. And a sort of middle ground between that two, where you have um, poor behavior, I, I assume that uh, as Francis has said, uh, and I think you made the point right at the very beginning, this is intended to be targeted really for 12 to 16 year old this year, who is probably carrying knives in school and so forth and so on, which is seen. You don't wish to prosecute them. Um, you don't want to start them on the bladed article um, <coughs> um, compulsory penalty ladder, really, in the long term ladder. But you need to control, you need a, a measure of control over their behaviour. Is that really so outrageous, really? I mean, is it, um, I, 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 I'm going by third serious knife murder um, committed by young men very shortly, um, which are actually all committed by racial minorities on, 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 their, on, their, on other racial minorities as well in different towns in this country. And where the mothers of one have said to me, but all the boys carry it. All of them in our area, down their tracks and bottoms. Is, is it not time some really strong measures of control were taken to deal with what is incredible social people where people are dying 
left, right, and centre? I mean, there is a knife crime problem. There's mm. a massive knife crime problem. I don't think, I don't think criminalisation is the is the answer. And you can have a KCPO post conviction, and and that I don't think it. I don't think it's entirely unproblematic, but it makes more sense to me having um, having a KCPO without any conviction and then subjecting someone to occasionally quite draconian um, if you look at the uh, if you look at the options available to the magistrate, a quite draconian um, set of restrictions um, for up to two years, but it can be renewable, so it could be four years, six years, so on. Um, and breach of it can result in a custodial sentence of up to two years, and that is a criminal. Um, it, it's a it's a punitive measure in, in, under the criminal law, and I feel that my disquiet, and I used that term earlier on, my disquiet about these orders generally is is that they are is effectively that they fast track. Um, the criminality of this population that we've already recognised as, if not problematic, then troubled. And arguably, we have, we know from the success of the model in, in Scotland that there are that, that there is a viable alternative that might be worth trying before we before we fast track the the criminalisation. And the, these orders haven't resulted in. Uh, or this legislation, I should say, haven't resulted in many orders as yet. The case law is very, very limited. So it's, um, I think, as Francis mentioned, it's, it's kind of yet to be seen if they're going to have any <coughs> real bite, any real effect. I think there was um, just one, wasn't there? I think, I think there was so two. Far. Well, maybe two. I think there was two. Two since they've come um, into that existence. Was the last, last time I checked, so there really haven't been many. So I think, I think to, to, to that extent, the jury is still out on whether or not there are going to be any any use, I am generally concerned about subjecting people to all these restrictions without there being a conviction. So, so I don't think we disagree, but um, in terms of the orders, perhaps, perhaps specifically. I think we have time for, uh, well, there are two hands and two more questions. So can we, can we take those questions together? And then maybe we can have comments on them together. So gentlemen in the middle there and then the lady. Um, so, so my background is I, I tend to prosecute, and I tend to prosecute um, in North East London, so a lot of gang stabbing cases. Um, and obviously the carrying of knives is a criminal offence, yeah. and it's often a, a start, uh, it's often a conviction on the start of the ladder to more serious offending, where people get convicted of wounding, causing groups of bodily harm, and, and as Charles just said, it in occasionally murder cases as well. Are these knife crime prevention orders not um, actually slowing down the eventual, eventual criminalisation of people who are very likely to be convicted of these offences in the future. I was frantically looking up a case when I was when you were talking, uh, and it's it's the case of Goff uh, and uh, a chief com uh, a chief constable of Derbyshire, which deals with the standard of proof uh, in the application of for these cr of these types of civil orders. So it predates knife crime prevention orders. But, but it deals with football banning orders. Yeah. And it's just a very short section. Can I just read it out? Um, so it, it says, it does not follow from this that a mere balance of probabilities suffices to justify making of an order. Banning orders under section 14b fall into the same category as antisocial behavior orders and sex offender orders. While made in civil proceedings, they impose serious restraints, restraints on freedoms that the citizen normally enjoys. While technically the civil standard of proof applies, <coughs> that standard is flexible and must reflect the consequences that will follow if the case for a banning order is made out. This should lead the justices to apply an exacting standard of proof that will in practice be hard to distinguish from the criminal standard. Mm. So effectively, in applying for these knife crime, pre knife crime prevention orders, you're having to prove that these people are um, have committed these acts, have been in possession of these knives, mm. knives to a very high standard, almost the civil, st or almost the criminal standard. Mm. Does that not slow down the eventual criminalisation of people by saying actually there's this intermediate step which gives you another chance to stop you from being criminalised, to try and turn you away from this kind of crime? And for those reasons, are they not a good idea? 
I know, I appreciate that. That sort of turns what, you, what you've been <laughs> saying on, your head, on its head. Do you want me to wait for the next? If that's okay, just yeah. in the interest of time. I've, just, I've got notes. My question was actually extremely similar to what Sam's just asked, which is that there are many types of civil parental orders where mm. it, it's the test sort of set out in golf, but the, the House of Lords authority for it was McCann, where mm. the hybrid test was explicitly held to be proof uh, beyond reasonable doubt of the facts on which whatever agency was applying for the order relied. And it was then only the necessity threshold that was a, a more evaluative judgment. Uh, it is the problem with knife crime prevention orders, not therefore, and in fact I think the position may be the same in respect to domestic abuse orders, where there's an increasing creep towards an explicit balance of probabilities standard. Uh, isn't that the problem, not the orders in themselves? Um, okay, I'm thinking about both at the same time. Um, what are you thinking? Can I? Can I? Oh, of course, of course. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it seems to me that if if the standard of proof is civil standard plus and is virtually up there with criminal standard, then that really emasculates these powers because that means that that um, it's going to be really, really hard to impose the sort of controls that they are ostensibly designed to impose. Now, I don't agree with that, because the question is, what do you have to prove? Uh, it's not a question of intent, I think, which may be difficult to prove. You just have to prove you've got a knife. Now, if your class and teacher has seen you've got a knife, he's either right or he's wrong. So that's, that's where the that's problem, a that's strong, where the is. strong but suspicion yes. that you could be carrying yeah, yeah. on it. Sorry, I, I, I got into <laughs> um, that. Sorry. In terms of KCPOs, so the, the, the football banning order is really interesting because, again, it's another one that has a lot of really quite um, draconian uh, restrictions that you can place, including surrendering your passport, so it doesn't matter if you're travelling for work. If there's a game happening, if there's an England game happening abroad, then you have to surrender your passport and things like that. So these restrictions are really quite considerable. But in terms of whether or not they slow down criminalisation. <laughs> it's difficult to say in terms of KCPOs specifically because there have been so few made, and I think we did check this, that it was, it was, it was down as low as two. Um, so it is, so I, to a certain extent, I speculate as to, uh, as to, as to what the result will be. <laughs> If they're being made and they're actually preventing people from carrying knives, then they would. My speculation is that they don't prevent people carrying knives at all, that people would just end up subject to the quite draconian interventionist restrictions and would end up being in breach, and in which sense they would just end up with a, with a fast-track criminalisation anyway. So. As I say, I speculate, but in terms of specifically the KCPO, I don't think <coughs> I don't see them slowing down criminalisation. I don't see that they're going to have a huge amount of purchase uh, in terms of the communities that we would hope that would be um, dissuaded in the kind of classic criminal sense of a deterrent effect of a KCPO. I don't see it. I don't see it happening. Um, in terms of civil standard plus, <clears throat> I feel if you're going to involve the, invoke the crim what is effectively a criminal standard, then just have a criminal standard and then there's no problem. Um, but if it's, a, if it's in a civil standard plus is still, is still a civil standard plus. So um, if it's going to, I think it makes far more sense to have it, to have the standard set it beyond reasonable doubt and then you'd be punished as a responsible subject of criminal. Would you agree with it if they said knife crime prevention orders uh, are to be imposed but they, but they must be on the criminal standard? That's a very good question. Would I agree with it? I think, I don't think they would be hugely effective for the reasons that I just outlined, but I would, I would certainly have far less of an issue with them um, were, it, were it on the criminal standard. Yeah. Just one sentence, Francis. Of course, it's not just about the standard mm. of proof that the tribunal applies. Mm. It's about the rules of evidence which exist in that tribunal 
to discharge mm. the burden of proof. Mm. And it's the rules of evidence of a criminal court as opposed to the rules mm. of evidence yes. of a civil court which make the difference, Ms. not the standard of proof. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and that's actually quite interesting when you take it out of the context of KCPOs and look at something like um, uh, proceeds of crime under POCA where, where the burden's reversed. Um, uh, well, let's not get into well. POCA. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be here all night. On forthcoming book. Um, on that note, uh, friends, there is wine no. and discussion can um, continue. Um, before I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers in the customary manner, I just wanted to say I've been passed a note to uh, tell me to inform you that the, uh, the section of the website with the academic associates on it has now been launched, so you can go and look at uh, details of us if you so wish, and also um, uh, there is a, a link to Dr. Hendry's article up on the website, for those of you who, yes, there is, who wish to uh, peruse at your leisure. So, if you wouldn't mind joining me, thank you very much. Thank you. Can, I, can I just say, the article is brilliant and well worth, well worth reading. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs>